um, as, I'm, as I'm here for these few days, our district isn't ready <laughs> for trauma-informed schools because we're still revising our discipline policy. And I'm still working with administrators who believe the stricter we become in our punishment, um, the better off we're going to be. So I'm taking it from the point of, when I'm in the audience of teachers, what practical things can I help them with that skill building that you've talked about? We can't teach empathy, but we can teach skills of empathy. I need that. So if you can point me in the direction of practical things that I can give to teachers, because I need those boots on the ground practical, because if I'm going to affect students, it's gonna be at a grassroots effort with what I do in, in the district, but in the same time, truly trying to get the buy-in of my administration when they have the time to talk to me, unfortunately. Um, so if you could point me in the direction, that would be super. I would offer one thing that I've kind of stumbled on. Are you familiar with Crisis Prevention Institute, CPI training, which basically teaches you um, how to put hands on students to, to keep them from harming themselves and such. But we found that sending teachers to that increases their sensitivity a little bit to the child in crisis uh, and, and to understand that the child is in crisis at that situa in that situation. So we have started sending as many teachers as possible to that training, not because they're likely going to need to put some of those holds on or, or do some of those things, but uh, the discussions around that. It's interesting how that's kind of opened a door for us. Uh, because I, I mentioned before, revising your discipline code as a faculty is a death spiral. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, yes. it, it, it festers and it brings out all of the worst things that are happening and, and it's really not just a non-productive activity, it's actually a harmful activity for your faculty. Uh, so perhaps just mm -hmm. talking to your special ed director and, and saying let's start training a lot of people including your least empathetic people in CPI training and see if they come back with something a little bit more uh, functional. What else? What else? One thing that I learned in reading in all these different silos, psychology, social work, um, wherever people have been writing about trauma for 20 years, is that truancy is a signal that there's trauma in a child's life. So it might be helpful, and I don't know, for you to start collecting the stories of why these kids are truant. And in your workshops, just tell the stories of why the kids were truant. Uh, and you're going to find all kinds of stuff. But you're a social worker, right? So you have been conditioned to deal with the mess that you're going to uncover. Tell them why the kids. Tell them what happened to the children. We did that in one of our, um, every year, my local unit does a conference on the state of education in Pennsylvania. And last year, we had a judge who had been a juvenile justice judge. And when he learned how come, when he learned why the people who, the youth who had gone before him ended up there, he left our conference to go tell the juvenile justice judges to take a new look at how they deal with truancy. Just one possible resource. Um, there's a, a book, I think it's called um, either Reaching and Teaching or Teaching and Reaching Students Who Hurt. It's by Susan Craig. And she really goes through a lot of like, classroom strategies that teachers can use. Um, so that's just one other resource to add to the list. So I don't have a resource, but I do think the process that I mentioned before can be very helpful and, and the inquiry process that I talked about. So this sustained professional development, and I guess I would take a slightly different position than Brian is that I would recommend starting with those who are interested, those who are receptive um, to change and, and who really want to do something different or want to do something better. In my experiences, because I spent seven semesters, seven consecutive semesters working with a group of teachers that started with a focus on family engagement and evolved into a focus on culture and a culture on, that talked about racism and bias. 
Um, it was only because we had developed that trust that we could, it could morph into that topic. But over the course of all that time, they brought their colleagues on board. And that school culture was transformed. This was a school with a farms rate of about 78%. Um, very large population of recent immigrant families that ended up having family learning nights with standing room only, where I'm, one of my moments that um, I'll never forget was at the end of the first one is watching these, these two dads walk out of the session and give each other a high five and say, I'll see you next month, man. That was pretty, that was pretty amazing. But that happened because of the teachers. Um, and they wanted, a few of them wanted change, and then that morphed into more and more. So I think you can influence culture, but it does take time. I love everything that was said. Um, one, um, in addition to hearing, um, hearing about student experience, um, one way to also think about that is to have student experiences of the policies themselves. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like X when we do this. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, I get a little bit worried when teachers are death spiraling or really stressed. It, it also, a really beautiful book is by Sonia Nieto. Um, and it, it's, it's, she talks about helping teachers find the joy in learning. And I just wonder if there's just a, um, a chance for teachers to just connect about what they love about their job um, to get to that place as well. And I would add just one more thing to your list of things to do uh, uh, when you go home. <laughs> but what, what county are you in? What county? Blair, Blair County, yes. I would connect with your children and youth executive director. Um, I, I think the power of, of systems communicating with each other cannot be underestimated. Uh, in Pennsylvania, one of the things we see is uh, between, say, Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, Child Welfare, Department of Health, whose kid is this? Um, it's a kid who's already in children and youth. They're responsible for making sure that child or that family gets services or is placed or if is stable and those kinds of things. And when they can work more directly with schools, um, it makes their job easier. When schools understand what the um, challenges of children and youth are and how uh, stretched their budgets are and how many more cases they have to field now, they, they care because it keeps kids, you know, out of their system. And juvenile justice will love you because if you guys do it right, it keeps those kids out of their system. And God knows they don't want those kids in that system, right? And children and youth and juvenile justice fight all the time about whose kid it is. So forming coalitions, I mean across systems as well. Um, and Blair County Children and Youth, they got a good executive director, and if you don't know who that person is, let me know, I'll hook you up, because they care, and they want to work together, because their job is hard enough alone. Does that make sense? Yeah. What other topic? We have probably one more topic we can tackle. Who's got something in there, sticking in their craw still? Um, thank you. Um, I, I come from a criminological background, and I was curious to know a little bit about following the question asked earlier, um, the invisible student population, which are the students that are co chronically truant, and a lot of them are because of the abuse at home or bullying in school. And I don't know if the programs that the panelists talked about, um, focusing on trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed, um, especially in classrooms, how are they addressing students who are not present in the classroom or disconnected from schools? Are there any components of the program that actually reach out to them that kind of capture them before the justice system actually um, pick them up? Thank you. I would say that I, I think my read of the truancy prevention and intervention literature actually suggests that um, a well-functioning school environment 
at minimum is your necessary but not sufficient case. Um, that while there are many forms of truancy, um, the, the topics you're talking about are of a relatively small proportion of your student body. Um, and that hopefully the more um, truancy is often an engagement problem as well as um, um, you know a, a more specialized issue and I guess the other side of this is relationships also help bring kids in so it's like home like those are the cases then that you're gonna want to go to the home figure out who's most uh, trustworthy to do that kind of work um, to, to figure out um, you know, with the idea that our job here is to pull the child back in, and I mean strongly. I think the DA's office in Philadelphia has a specific program for this. If you want to check with them, he has a, a person assigned to this, and they have a wraparound kind of um, model Call the DA's office in Philadelphia and, and check me out on that. I believe they do. I think there are things a local school district can do as well. We, we convened a truancy task force, which is a lot of community members, and we had local judges and doctors uh, and got a lot of wide-ranging input on this. And there are some things that we were doing. For example, our, our letters were nasty. Our, our truancy letters, our attendance letters, they were... Mm -hmm. They were nasty and they were in compliance with the law, but they were completely retooled to be more inviting, to be more collaborative, to, to bring a team of, of, of people together to help eliminate truancy. I think most school districts probably can improve what they're doing when it comes to student attendance. It's very punitive in a lot of districts. You can't make up work and things like that. Second, I think you need to have programs that engage kids and give them a reason to come to school. I know that sounds simple, but I don't care where it comes from. We're looking for it. For, in our district, I was fortunate enough that uh, we had to hire a football coach and one moved to us from South Carolina who's just phenomenal. Now the legend grows, he was coming to us that I went to SEC country to find this guy and brought him, <laughs> brought him back just because I wanted a winning football team. That's not it at all. But we have 1,300 students in our high school and we now have 84 boys on our football team, which is a tremendous number, which means that's 84 uh, students who the coaches are on them about their grades, and if they don't show up to school, they're being called and such. So uh, we created a, a class, Strength Training for Athletes. We created a class in, during school, um, and we created a section for male students and a section for female students. We now have four sections, two female sections and two male sections. So that may not seem very academic, but it's another way that they are connected in school, and I can go through a list of, of different little investments we've made that would give a child a reason to come to school. Yeah. So I think the technical aspects of a truancy task force, a truancy elimination plan, plus continually give students a reason to want to come to school, just don't, don't ignore those opportunities uh, to, again, reduce that number uh, to something more manageable to help address. The superintendent reminds me when we do workshops with um, school districts, we say, whatever you do, you keep your art program and your music program, because these wounded children will come to sing, and they will come to create. And the healing, the healing aspects of art and music, well, there's art therapy, there's music therapy, so you know it's healing. And kids will come to school just to do that. I think another strategy, which of course is inherent in Head Start, is home visiting. And you may have noticed on my slide, one of the things I said that was the outcome of this work that I did with this one school was that there were grade level teachers who ended up doing home visits. The sub, um, the, the principal used some Title I funds to pay for subs. So they actually went, parents were very surprised. Why do you want to come into my home? Um, and they were resistant. A couple of them refused, but many of them said yes. And the teachers found that it not only allowed them to develop a totally different relationship with these families, but it gave them amazing insights into the 
family um, and, and the family life and the child in the context of the family. So I, again, I, I think the common theme, which Jenny said, is relationships make a difference. If parents trust you um, and children, students trust you, I, I think you can more easily break down those issues related to truancy. Just, just another example, um, and this, this is one that, um, that I heard about from our school psychologist that, that works directly in schools, and I think this is one of those examples that has circulated a lot, so maybe people have heard it. But, um, you know, there's an activity that a faculty can do where you take, it works, of course, better in, a, I suppose, a, a smaller school or with fewer students, but you put a post-it note on the wall for every, with the name of every student in the school, and then during the faculty meeting, you have each faculty person go up, each teacher, and take off the post-it note of a student that they feel that they have a good relationship with. And then you look at the end, after everybody has done that, to see who are the names that are still on the wall, that nobody picked that post-it note off. Um, it sort of reminds me of your example about spending time, 15 minutes with the student that you least know or least like. But that's another way to sort of, as a faculty survey, who are the kids that have no connection to anybody in the building? And who knows, those might be the kids who are true. Yeah. You never know. Yes. And we have to start wrapping up because I know you have flights to catch. Um, but one other thing, let's not forget that Pennsylvania is a communities that care state, which means that children and youth resources, CTC mobilizers in any county that wants one. Um, not every county has them. If they don't have them, we can bug them to, to, to have a, a mobilizer. And a mobilizer is supposed to garner resources, just like for kids that you're talking about, working with children and youth and all the families that get referred through general protective services. And that list is growing, growing, growing with all of the calls to Childline, right? So there's all kinds of services that are being offered in the community, right, that if we mobilize around some of these issues, we'll have, uh, so much better coverage and communities that care mobilizers it's their job to know and maybe it's their job to help us with these coalitions that's another idea that I got that I, we talked about I think you and I did Susan so Pennsylvania is, is a good place to start and we can be a model if we mobilize right and if we fight together instead of apart so I want to give a heartfelt thank you to all of our presenters who took time away from their families and their work to come join us. Thank you so much. A big round of applause. Please. And we'll be bugging you for the book that we're writing. And we'll help you, I promise. I need to remind everybody to turn in your evals, turn in your credit evals. Your name badges, we'll recycle them, get your parking permits validated. And a please, a big round of applause for Sherry and Sandy. Thank you for organizing everything. And one big round of applause for Carlo. Thank you for stepping up this time. All right, we'll see you guys next year. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, you yes. 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 yes.